Here's Leah Rose with Jessica Dobson of Deep Sea Diver. Let's talk a little bit about your new album. Yeah. So how has the the pandemic changed the release and the marketing? Well, you know, most dramatically, no touring for everybody. That's, you know, the most foreign thing. Usually this is the time you're getting ready to hit the road. And like, if there's any momentum, keep pushing that momentum forward, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's always been how we've uh, gained new, new fans and followers is just like with the live show and meeting other bands on the road. And it really is devastating. But uh, we've tried to to pivot and be as scrappy as possible and, you know, try to figure out what it looks like for us to, I guess the only presence you can have now is online. And so just like figuring out how we want to do that and be creative with that, that medium. And then have you had to sort of reimagine how you present the live show or even the new music now that everything's just kind of like on zoom or you're live streaming? Absolutely. Uh, for a while we were doing like a weekly live stream when this first hit and stop pretending came out of, uh, the stay home tours, like live streams that we were doing on Sunday nights. And Peter had this like crazy idea. Like, I think it was the first live stream we did at the end of the live stream. He played a drum beat. We recorded it live as we were showing people it on like Instagram. And he said, okay, this drum beat that I just played, we recorded it and we're going to upload it to Dropbox. Whoever wants to download it, take it and write your own song to it. At the end of that week, like people's submissions were due because I was so interested to see like, okay, obviously everyone has a different brain, different melodic sensibilities. There's going to be so many different submissions. I actually didn't know how many people were going to participate. And we ended up getting like 70 people sent in songs with this one looped drum beat. And towards the end of the week when it was due... I hadn't even started writing on that drum beat yet. And I was like, that's kind of lame if I ask people to write, like (laughs) write a song, but I don't even do it. Yeah. So I sat in the studio and I tried to write to the drum beat and whatever was coming out was kind of lifeless. And I ended up going on a walk and I came back and then stop pretending just came out. So it was written in a day. It was mixed the next day by me in the home studio. And then it was released the next day after that. Never done anything like that. And it has the line, um, everything's falling apart. Yeah, honey, I can't pretend to understand why everything's falling apart. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, I've been singing that around the house. My little two-year-old was singing it too. Oh, (laughs) yeah. picked up on it. Yeah, it's so good. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, it definitely was, you know, a song very much influenced, you know, by the times. It's just like... It's so perfect. Yeah, everything was just so, uh, so... unsure and still is there's no end date to what's going on right now and it's just like almost like okay I could write like a terror filled song or just something that just kind of like all right call a spade a spade this situation is totally messed up and I don't know what's going on and I can't pretend to understand but just like I don't know the resilience of the human spirit and and relating on that meant a lot to me and so for some reason yeah the song came out stop pretending so your sound classically is sort of really um, warm and poppy, fuzzy, sort of dreamy. Mm-hmm. How would you say that your sound has evolved over the course of the three albums? I think that the first album was kind of leaning more into like jangly pop. Um, with songs like You Go Running kind of, you know, at the time was influenced more by like Phoenix and the Smiths and um but then also total contrast like a lot of ballads that were darker I I love Nick Cave and and so I was kind of just like finding my footing in in the first record and then the second one I think I had I really tried to step out more with like leading with guitar and so there was a lot more jammy moments and guitar solos and heaviness and then this record I kind of feel like I I came home again to like some of my my like earlier influences a lot more like narrative storytelling and mm-hmm. songwriting it's something that I had kind of dismissed for a while or didn't think I was good enough at. And so I think a lot these songs breathe really well and they maybe are not as heavy in terms of like the rock world that maybe secrets lived in. They are a lot more vulnerable. So I don't and, and then musically there's still like a lot of those stabby guitar moments that I think I, I tried to write a lot of like 
what I perceived as that sounded uh, almost like I'm singing a lyric melody, but through guitar. There's a lot of those moments. So it's an extension of my voice instead of just like heaviness and loudness and jamminess and feedback and all that. So yeah, it's a lot more m- melodic. Yeah, it's super catchy. You know, I've listened to the album a lot over the the last week and it's like yeah. by the second or third listen, it's like, I feel like I'm right there and I know the melodies and they're totally sinking in. Oh, that's awesome. How do you not play a melody that you've already heard from another song? Or how do you even know if you're, yeah, you know, like recreating something unconsciously? I, that seems like the <laughs> hardest part of songwriting. I just feel like I would sit down and, you know, play yeah. like some, like something very obvious and well-known. Totally. There have been moments where I literally have, I mean, I know I have it on voice memos where somewhere of just like being so excited to show Peter, who's my partner in the band, or the whole band, just like check out this new song. And then someone goes like, yeah, that's like a Feist song, like that melody right there or or whatever. Like, um, And, you know, something that I'll be so excited about and I'll just have, I, I just, yeah, be wrapped up in the moment, not even realize that it's like a total ripoff. And then other times I write songs by ripping off melodies so then I can get into the mindset of that artist or like literally just like pretending and trying to get out of you know my headspace and then from there having the freedom to make it my own. Yeah Kevin Parker from Tame Impala was talking about the same thing Mm. and he was saying when he writes he often tries to make a continuation of a song Right. That's like he'll awesome. listen. He was like talking about a Beach House song that he was obsessed with. And then he tried to write like the next volume of that song. Yeah. That's a great idea. Anything that helps, like we just get in our heads all the time. And there's so many reasons, you know, why not to push forward on a song. And so all of those little tools are so necessary and helpful. So you produce this album, right? Co produced. Yep. My first one. I think I've been producing my whole life without knowing it and without giving it the official title, but like, or, or attempting to produce things. But this was the the first official one. Yeah. Did you come to it with an overall vision for the project? Uh, I first came to it actually in a, a very scared place. <laughs> um, I, at the time when we were going to record this, this record that that's coming out now, we had already attempted twice to make a record coming right off the heels of like secrets and it didn't go well. And I was in a pretty low, dark place and questioning a lot. And, uh, I had finally, like I had a couple songs that I saw some sparks in, but I was still in a pretty, pretty low place. And Peter came downstairs. I remember one day and he was like, I think you're going to produce this record. You need to produce this record. And I just instantly started crying. I don't know why, but, I just was in such a fucked up place and and just like didn't even have the self-confidence that to think that like, yeah, that's a good idea. So was that more pressure? Did that feel like, oh no, now I have two jobs to do? Yeah, I know. It felt like, oh no, if I step into that role, like it, this record will never get made or it, I'll overthink it. Um, then it, if it doesn't do well, it will really be all on me because I produced it. And so I, there's so much fear wrapped up in that. And uh, for a number of reasons, but like basically in the end, I I was just like, you know what? I need to do this and I think I'm prepared to do it and I'm ready to jump up over that cliff. And I basically sought out like a co-producer for the things that I knew that I was not, like I needed a right-hand man of just like, I'm not good at time management. I will press record a thousand times. And and then not even use it. And and Andy, so Andy Park is was my co-producer for this. And there's so many wonderful things he brought to the table and really challenged me to like sharpen the tip on all of the songs and the lyrics. And yeah, it was such a fun, joyful experience. That's amazing. Also, it sounds like exactly what you needed to do. I think so too. Yeah, I think a lot of things had been preparing me for this record. I lived in records when I was a kid, just, I didn't realize that it was like kind of a producer mindset, but I would pick apart different frequencies and, okay, these are the highs and these are the lows of the song. And I would try to imagine how they would get those sounds. 
And and so, yeah, it feels like I was preparing myself my whole life, but just didn't know it. Well, yeah, maybe you didn't have the language for it yet, but exactly. you had the intention and you had the interest, really. Yeah, totally. On Lights Out, the song, I was just curious from a producer standpoint, there's a little what sounds like a little vocal sample at the beginning of the song. And then the whole, you know, the beat drops and it sort of disappears from that moment. What was the thinking behind that? The one that says hot mic. (laughs) Oh, is that what it says? Yeah. And I don't know why I said hot mic, but there's, we're always trying to like keep spirits light in the studio. But uh, that's actually interesting that you asked me this question because I wanted moments on this record that brought you into a different world and then also back. And then I wanted you to be able to feel like you were in the studio with us too. Yeah, it's cool. It's almost like you're there right before the song starts. Totally. And hearing, you know, two or three seconds before the band starts playing, you feel the power of the band in a new way. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of moments like that on like broken social scene records you hear that in a lot of hip hop records, actually, too. I mean, I'm sure you know. Yes. Yeah. That's what it reminded me of. Yeah. I especially love the kind of, especially those reprises like that Kendrick Lamar does. And they're thematic. And like, it feels like he's talking directly to you. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Very cool. That song is just undeniable. I mean, that's one of the real, one of the songs that really like hooked its claws into me quick. It always kind of amazes me how short it is because it seems like there's a lot packed into it. But the songs on this record in general are shorter. And I didn't try to do that, but somehow it came out that way. But they're, these little, that one's a little fireball. <laughs> so I'm curious about your thoughts about the music industry because you've been in the music industry for a really long time. Yep. Um, you were signed at 19 with right. Atlantic. What, what type of music were you making back then and, and how did that happen? At that time, that was kind of like, like right before the Atlantic record deal happened, I was playing coffee shops around, like I grew up in La Habra, Fullerton area, and was just kind of like just starting to come onto the scene and meet new people. And one of the first people I met was uh, this guy, Eli Thompson, and he played with um, Richard Swift who has since passed and rest in peace, Richard. Um, we played together in the shins. I, that's when I started buying a ton of records and going to Amoeba like every Sunday. And they were expanding my, my little 18, 19 year old brain. And, uh, they kind of took me under their wing and we recorded my first demos. So out of those demos, there was this song called most Sundays that I kind of had this very, like, I guess you could say Richard Swift and Elliot Smith kind of swung beat. And that was the song that kind of, I guess, put me on the map in front of these major label types. My manager at the time had me do showcases. I didn't know what I was doing. I just showed up and played the songs with my band. And then it seemed pretty crazy. All of a sudden there was a deal on the table and I was super young. And I was like, oh, if I don't take this, then I guess nothing like this will come again. So I should probably take this deal. Um, so once I signed the deal and kind of felt like I was in this weird faceless system, like, I think that's where I started getting anxiety, but didn't know what that was either at at the time. I ended up like losing my voice for my actual speaking voice and singing voice for five months. It was the craziest experience. That seems very symbolic. Honestly, like (laughs) wasn't lost (laughs) on me. I know it's super crazy. I, I think, you know, since that time, like as I've reflected a lot more on it, I think I've been searching for that for I'm always searching for like musical community and more connection because that took me out of it right away. And control. Totally. Yeah. I heard Katy Perry talking about this and she because she she was trying to like make it and break through for so long Mm -hmm. and she was at it. And she was in that Christian realm too, like Christian music realm, I think beginning starting out. Yeah, which is a totally different scene, but. Yeah. And I think she was at it for like 10 years and then she made the most unchristian song ever. Right. Um, right. I kissed a girl and, then, <laughs> and she like totally blew up. Yeah. But I think even she was like totally surprised. But I think that's the key though. You never know when something's going to yeah. quote unquote work, whatever that means. And I, I think, I think that's a good example because she 
put in the work. Like it didn't come out of nothing. And whatever she thought was a failure, like set her up for that moment. And, and then, you know, you could flash forward today and, you know, like, it's like nobody can recreate their successes and you go through these valleys and peaks of what success looks like to you as an artist. And I don't know, it's just kind of so much is right place, right time. And this weird alchemy of a ton of things. Yeah. And then what, what did end up happening to the deal? I was just so sad. Music, the joy of it was, was just absolutely squeezed out of it for me. And just having experienced like different kinds of rejection amidst what looked like a big quote unquote success. It was a failure for me. And like, uh, I was embarrassed. I didn't know what to do. And I ended up just kind of putting my head in the sand and stopped playing music for like a year and ran a coffee shop. Like I was like a partial investor and just like totally doing like Peter, who's now, uh, I'm married to him and he's in the band. He plays drums. He, at the time we were just best friends and he came down and he was like, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you running a coffee shop? You should be playing music. And like totally helped me out of and back into just playing again and find, being able to find joy in it. So that was pretty sweet. You're like, I'm marrying you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Good choice. Yeah, totally. And what's it like collaborating with your husband? How does that change the the dynamic of your relationship? Are you always talking about music at home or or are you able to sort of like compartmentalize those conversations it's tricky to car- compartmentalize the conversations uh we definitely both have the brains that don't know how to shut things we're passionate about off but i am so grateful for for peter i mean just personally as my partner but then in a musical setting we couldn't be any different um he is like I love how just kind of ADD he is with his ideas and he doesn't give a shit about looking foolish. He'll throw like a thousand ideas out into the room. And, you know, he himself will say like, yeah, like 999 of these are probably not good or not good. And, but the one that makes it, it's like, he's like this burst of energy and these little spurts and he's the sparker in the band. Totally. Yeah. I was going to say, sometimes you need that to get just the ideas flowing and the energy going. Someone just needs to say something. And then it'll turn into something. Totally. And I think that like he got that a lot from like. Uh, like improv kind of. Uh, improv. Yeah. yeah. Improv. Yes. So he's a yes and person. You, there's no like, hey, I don't want to do this thing that you just started us on the path of. It's just like, OK, I'm taking what you just said and then I have to and it. Yes. And. And so he's constantly getting on me when I like am not being open to like, let's say he'll present something like an idea, musical or creative, whatever. And if I like kind of reject it or don't want to get into it, he gets upset. And I totally get that. And that's where I need to be pushed in is just being freer and not as precious about things. So he is just wonderful, like in in that arena and obviously a fantastic drummer. And just yeah, he's crazy. He's just like so much energy. Yeah. And live like he's it's like so and it's really fun to see like. Him and and Garrett, who plays in the band, he plays bass in the band, like the way they play off of each other. Uh, you know, Peter tends to kind of be like slightly on top of the beat and Gary tends to be just slightly behind. And it's like, it's perfect. I love it. And you guys really jam out when you play live. Mm-hmm. Is that orchestrated ahead of time or does that happen naturally? Is it like an, a really an authentic jam or is that sort of more pre-planned? Typically, I don't know. It's just one of those magic moments. Like when we go into longer jams and really stretch it out. There's a song on the record called Eyes Are Red that has like a three minute guitar solo on it. And it gets into this kind of um, LCD sound system, hypnotic groove for like three minutes. And sometimes live we'll tease that out for like 10 minutes. And it just depends on what the mood is. And it's fun to, I don't know, feel the freedom in terms of like guitar playing of when you start finding that you're playing things, what you're hearing in your head at that moment in the middle of a live show, but you've not necessarily played is coming out on guitar. And that's just years of playing, but like, yeah, it's kind of thrilling. And so it's one of my most favorite moments when you, as a band, you can get to those places. 
When this song was first written, it's the, it was the last song. The, the album was done. And then I asked like my managers one day, I was like, do you think this record needs another song? And they're like, it wouldn't, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to try. Do you want to try a co-write? And I was like, uh, yeah. And so I went down to California with uh, this woman named Jen DeSilvio and Peter came with me too. And I tried to show up to this session without any preconceived melodic, lyrical, just anything, just try to keep my head super clear. But then <laughs> my personality really came out like of just like that, but oh shit, I don't have a plan B. And so the, without me trying, this lyric just came out in my head. I was like in the shower before we got there and I was like, but that was then and this is now. And I just kept hearing that lyric over and over. And then when I got to the to Jen's studio, we hopped into it pretty pretty much right away and she was playing this thing on piano. And I think out of nervousness, I started playing my guitar. And that's where the... And she looked at me and she pointed and she was like, yep, there it is. Because she was writing something totally different. And then, I mean, that's the gifting of a songwriter, I guess, when you're in that world is just, you know, where to point the energy. Mm -hmm. And she just totally honed in and she's like, what is that? And I was like, I don't know. I've never played this before ever. <laughs> also the gift of collaboration, because if you were alone, you might not have, that could have been totally a throwaway. 100%. I just was so, it was one of those just magic moments of like being in the room, seeing this song come out in like two hours, not a thing was changed after the fact. And then how did Sharon Van Etten get on it? Oh, I love Sharon. Uh, Me too. She, yeah, she's one of she's my incredible. favorites. She really is. And so, okay, so her brothers were fans of Deep Sea Diver for like the last three or four years, I think. And I remember like a long time ago being tagged by one of her brothers and say, seeing this thing on Facebook or something like, hey, Sharon, this is the band I was telling you about. And I was like, is that Sharon Van Etten? Like, holy shit. Okay. Um, and then, then, you know, I f didn't think about that for a while. And then she had this record coming out, which was Remind Me Tomorrow. And I heard the first, I think it was the first single, Jupiter 4. And I was just like, holy shit, I love this song. And I don't know what compelled me. I just wrote her on Instagram. And I just told her how much I respected. I So kind of like in the same vein of like Feist, Patti Smith, Cat Power, Nico Case. There's so many like women that I love and respect that create their own timelines for how they want to do things. And there is a total similar thread between all of them. They're, they're, they're people of like great substance. She's one of those women. Yeah. And I said, thank you. Like, you know, cause she stepped away for a second to, to go to school. She had a kid. It's like all these things that are like in terms of industry standards and how you do things and release a record every two years and come back. Okay. Right. Start writing and do it again. Like that's a huge finger in the face. And I want to be that example too, of just like, no, you don't have to follow those rules. And so I saw that in her and I just said, thank you. So then a couple months later, she was coming through to the Neptune at, in Seattle. And I, I went to that show and then I, I think I like tagged her on Instagram and in a story. And I was just like, there's nowhere else I'd rather be besides here the night before we finish our record. And then the next day we went to the studio to record Impossible Wait. And as we were recording it, I, I was, I asked myself, I think it was internally at first. I was like, man, it would be so cool if Sharon sang on this. And then I was in the bathroom and Peter, he just yelled, he's like, Sharon messaged you. I was like, what? And so I, I just went out there and, and she said the most, just the most kind words. And eventually I asked, I was like, Hey, like I have this song. Do you want to hear it? If you wanted to sing on it, let me know. Like hear it. Like, I'm totally, totally up for whatever. Just like, and if it doesn't speak to you, forget I asked. I find it was like midnight, like one night, months, like a few months later. And, I, and a little message came through and it was like, I can do this. And I'm super stoked. And I, I was just so excited that it worked out. All right. Let's talk about Switchblade a little bit. Yeah. It's written in third person. Who, who are you talking about? I think it's kind of like a mixture of a lot of stories that, that I heard firsthand at the commons with the, the women I was spending time with. So this organization that I started volunteering at is called the Aurora Commons. And it's a 
safe place for our unhoused neighbors, those that are drug dependent, um, involved in sex-based work on the street. And it's a place where you can come, you don't have to be free of drugs. Um, and you, there's, you're treated with dignity and respect. And I was so drawn to this place because I hadn't found anything like it. And I live off of Aurora, which is like a highway, um, kind of that runs parallel to the five freeway in Seattle. And a lot of the women, you know, work on the streets uh, by where I live. And you walk by, I walk by them every day. And, we, you know, we're constantly passing people every day and we have no idea what their stories are. And we make assumptions and and put labels on people. And it's just, I think it's such a disservice to to ourselves and others. But we do have that kind of comment there, like that it's harder than you think line. Like it's hard to receive. It's hard to receive other people's help. I need other people's help. Like we're all in the same boat. We all carry, like I said, like these little traumas around with us or large traumas and that can feel so suffocating. And I wanted to write a song just like, I hear you and you are important and you belong here. At the beginning of the record, it seems like you're in a really low place. Yes. And then you must be able to build up your confidence if this is the first time you're producing an album. You have to write all these songs. I imagine totally. you write a lot of the instrumental parts as well. Yeah. So that's a huge accomplishment. Thank you. And so I'm just wondering, like, coming out the other side of that, has has that actually helped how you're feeling? Yeah, it, it did. And, like, it's just that, you know, the paradox of, like, you think if you dismantle things and kind of like strip everything away that it's going to be this naked, crazy place where um, you might not push through and then you're left looking kind of foolish. But I think that by kind of dismantling, meaning like getting lower, getting into the dirt, like allowing uh, myself to be more compassionate to myself and others and vulnerable, like in that process, like it felt really joyous instead of scary as it was happening. And I think right now I'm just like reveling in the the joy of what we created and just being thankful for that. Well, thank you for being so gracious with your time and thank you for, for sitting down and, and talking. It was so much fun. Oh my gosh, the feeling is mutual and I really appreciate you asking me to be on the show. Thanks to Jessica Dobson for opening up about her creative process with Leah. You can hear Deep Sea Diver's new album, Impossible Wait, along with some of our other favorite Deep Sea Diver tracks on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brokenrecordpodcast. There you can find extended cuts of new and old episodes. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and is executive produced by Mia Lobel. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like Broken Record, please remember to share, rate, and review our show on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. Peace. <laughs>